The Kauai Eco Roundtable started about 10 years ago, and we vowed to do it every six months, and uh, we do it maybe once every year, year and a half, uh, and I promise we'll be more diligent and do it more often, because it, it's an excellent way for us to network and talk to each other and not be redundant and uh, get ideas from each other. Uh, the last Eco Roundtable created a coalition of five groups that work to educate people about the uh, rim of the Pacific Naval War uh, exercises that, um, and in, that had all these tremendous environmental impacts that nobody was paying attention to. So the Eco Roundtable, I think, has been a really important force here on Kauai. And, and uh, like I say, hopefully we'll do it every six months. My name is Gordon Lebeds, and my wife and I, Diana Lebeds, are kind of the kingpins of the Eco Roundtable uh, Coalition. And the way this works, since we have a pretty small group, I think we can give each, each group up to five minutes to basically explain what you do or what your idea is to do uh, when you meet that's important, when you meet, what you do, a, a website if it's easy to remember, and then uh, kind of talk about the kind of activities that, that your group is doing, and, uh, and um, uh, at the end of it, we can all intermingle and share and work together uh, on, on projects that, that make sense for us to work together on. Aloha kako. Hello everyone. Uh, feedback. Okay, I'll get used to this. Bear with me. Although most of you know me by my nom de guerre, Branch Harmony, my hereditary and legal name is Kalani Kumai Kamakahuli Uli or Naali Hano. That's why I use Branch Harmony. Uh, I'd like to just first begin where the Puleas is the tradition of our forefathers in this land. And this is a prayer to heal the land, I think appropriate. E te atua o akua, he pulia e holoi ana i kapoino o kaina. This is a prayer to cause cleansing of the misfortunes of the land. A me kapale a e i pau and to ward off all of the land's desecration. This is a prayer to cause ending of all the wrongs of the land. Kulupia ameka po luluka ipau ka kuli alana that the blight ends and the moisture returns and that the, the decay ends and the peace returns and that the bitterness ends. Alaina miho peku ho emu. Hui kala malapa malapa kai ka mauli ho i ke akua e. And therefore, buds, shooting, weeding, complete cleansing, renew offerings, thanking the akua. Amama wanoa mahalo. Okay, so the first group is the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, vsh.org. Vegetarian Society of Hawaii meets on the first Sunday of each month at the Kapa'a Neighborhood Center. At that, at that time, and they've been active for about eight years, the first Sunday of eight months, we haven't missed a day. It's a potluck. Uh, it's, uh, a vegan potluck. There's no dairy products. It's a completely uh, animal product free potluck and a lecture or a movie every month on vegetarianism. 
Vegetarianism is the most single most important thing that you as an individual can do to protect the environment. There's no debate about that. You can give up driving your car and it wouldn't have the same impact as becoming a vegetarian. Eating beef and eating fish are among the most destructive environmental practices that a person can do from the point of view of energy, point of view of water, the point of view of air pollution and global warming. I could talk for an hour on this subject, on the environmental impacts of, of our animal-based diet. Uh, but the Veggie Society is, uh, we don't have a table here, but um, they have the Oahu lectures on Hoiki, uh, what, what is Hoiki, channel 54 on cable uh, on Sunday at one o'clock uh, on television. And the first Sunday of each, each month is the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. So I'd urge you to check it out. If you're not a vegetarian, you, you'll, that'll be the best meal you've eaten that month. I promise you that. So that's kind of the format that we want to do. We don't have to give a long thing. And there won't be question and answers. The discussions will, unless it's a real critical question, because again, we have a pretty small group here tonight. Um, so that, so what I'm going to do is, is, in the order that you guys signed in, I'm going to introduce the, the group, and then you're basically on your own. You're going to introduce yourself. Uh, so the, for the second group will be uh, the Nature Conservancy. Um, and Marissa and Tesla, both? Marissa and Tesla? Both Marissa and Tesla. OK, here you go. Well, hello, my name is Tesla. Uh, I'm one new Kupu intern with the Nature Conservancy, so I actually just moved to Kauai um, a couple weeks ago, so still getting the lay of the land. Um, the Nature Conservancy's mission is to preserve all uh, water and land on, uh, for human life, uh, which is great for them. Um, it's a great thing to do, and we're here to help them with their mission on Kauai. Um, but our mission on Kauai is to protect the native watershed, and we do that um, through fencing and ungulate control, as well as invasive plant control. Um, and also, Melissa, our office manager, wanted us to let everyone know we have a job opening for a program assistant. If anyone wants to know more about that, they can ask us afterwards. Can yeah. anything? Oh uh, yeah, my name is Marissa, and I am another Kupu intern. Everything she said applies for me as well. Yeah. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. <guys>. Thank you. <laughs> the Nature Conservancy has an office on right, uh, right off Rice Street here in the Hui. And, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Marissa and Tesla. Um, Pat Gagan of Zero Waste Kauai. Pat, thanks. Thank you, Gordon. Aloha. Thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Pat Gagan. I'm here with John Harder, who's also with Zero Waste Kauai. Uh, what does Zero Waste Kauai do? Actually, we're a group of people. We get together about once a month. Uh, generally, it was the first Tuesday of the month, but our days have been changing a little bit. Um, and we discuss issues having to do with sustainable materials management. So what does that mean? That means everything from the moment you buy something or make that decision to buy it to how you end up disposing of it. Okay, um, to, to make it simple, we're, we're a group that got together, um, heard that somebody was talking about starting to burn garbage. What a horrible thing to do when you're taking all these plastics that can be recycled, paper that can be recycled, doing that type of thing, um, which was really the impetus to get Zero Waste Kauai started. Uh, since then, we've done a lot. We really focus on education and advocacy for sustainable solutions. So who do we try to educate? decision makers. We've sat down with most of the county council members, many of our state and our federal representatives, and let them know that, you know what, there are some very good ways to deal with these issues instead of continuing to bury them, to burn them, to do things like that. Um, but I don't want you to think that zero waste is only focused on the end product, what you do after you've purchased something and done it. It really has to do with how you think and consumption. If you think about it, you know, one, one of the examples I like to give is a Happy Meal. You know, kids love them, right? They get a little toy. How long does that toy last? It's probably gone by the next day, if not the next hour, right? And too much of our society is like that. So what we really need to do is pay attention to what we're doing when we are buying things, buy things that are going to be sustainable, long-lasting, that can be repaired. Spend that extra money so that you don't have to buy two or three of them and just throw them away. 
and make sure you're only buying the things you need. Why not borrow things when you can? So zero waste encompasses all of that. A lot of what we've been focusing on is we've done events to try to teach people about composting, other ways that they can manage materials that they have at home, trying to get that stuff out of the landfill. Nobody likes a landfill. Landfills create some of the most greenhouse gases that we have. It's actually the second largest single contributor, large contributor on the island is our landfill to greenhouse gases. That's next to the energy you use. But now how much of the energy you use is to create stuff that you end up throwing away. <laughs> Take a focus on that. And there's a, some resources in back, I'm just gonna go over them. One is a zero waste, a local solution to climate change. Things you can start doing today that will have an impact on climate change. Remember, how did we get here? All of us made decisions that started creating problems for the climate. Let's start making decisions that are gonna create solutions for the problems we've created, one solution at a time. Um, we've got information back there about us. We've been doing a lot of work with the county, uh, promoting the good things that they're doing. If you have any questions about what to do with any of your solid waste, your recycling, any of your material management that you wanna make sure you're disposing of correctly, the, the most uh, environmentally friendly and usually cost effective way, they can tell you that. One of the other things that we're focusing on right now is actually trying to get rid of styrofoam. If you think about it, what happens with styrofoam? You go get your plate lunch, you eat it once, and it's in the garbage. It can't be recycled, it can't be reused. I mean, there's not, nothing good for it. So we're trying to get green alternatives out there. So what we've got are some little business cards that say, hey, chef, we love your food, but can you please put it on something that's not styrofoam, something healthier and friendlier to the environment. So if you're interested in zero waste, we do have a website at zerowastekawaii.net. So zerowastekawaii.net. Please feel free to go out there and visit. Otherwise, give myself, Pat Gagan, a call or John Harder, and we'll be happy to talk with you. Today, you can sign up and back and get on our mailing list. And when we send something out, we'll contact you. So thank you. Thanks, Pat. Branch? Branch Harmony, come on. I'm here as the Kaka'ola, the acting Kaka'ola or spokesperson for the Ahamoku of Koloa, uh, the Ahamoku Advisory Council, uh, formed back in what, 2012, I believe, uh, by July, July 9th, 2012, Act 288 establishes the Ahamoku Advisory Council within the DLNR. Uh, for Koloa, the Po'o, uh, our representative for the Koloa Moku is uh, Billy Kaohi Lauli'i right here. Uh, and I just serve as a spokesman for what we discuss on this and sharing. Um, Billy's my classmate from oh, fourth, fifth grade Koloa school days. Uh, the Ahamoku system is to provide advice on integrating Native Hawaiian resource management practices with Western practices in each moku uh, to ID comprehensive set of Native Hawaiian practices for natural resource management. I have this that I can share with people, but what I'd like to say about it is um, what we do is uh, we're in the process of development of a regional-based sustainable resource management plan. I'll say it again. A regionally-based sustainable resource management plan for Koloa Moku to be a model. Uh, our immediate threat that we're facing is the HDF dairy threatening water, soil, air, and quality of life for the whole South Shore and the economy. Other threats that we're trying to get a grasp on and identify and deal with is water diversions. We know now that there are 274 water diversions on the island of Kauai, only two of which are in compliance with reporting requirements. There is no enforcement by the Water Commission. We have to act within communities because of the climate change conditions affecting especially the Kona district. 
we have to reforest and regreen all our streams and get water quality back in there so that we can attract the rain. Um, uh, water diversions, Wild Pili Stream, Wild Pili Hale, uh, the Kalo Beds in Mahapulipu, which sustain Aina. The word Aina doesn't mean earth, Honua is earth. Aina means arable soil, soil that you can grow food in. And the valley there has been arable soil, Aina for growing Kalo for many, many generations. I want to see orange trees and uh, Ulu and, uh, you know, we used to transport uh, Uwala, a sweet potato, to the mainland. Uh, drainage, flooding in the South Shore area because of the changes with the roadway, with, wild, with uh, the wild high, now uh, with the village at Poipu they're talking about. All the drainage comes down into Mano Kalanipo Park and into the Heiau area, Kaniuoluma, uh, and just collects there. And, you know, we have memories of people seeing three or four cars just floating down below Mano Kalanipo Park for days. Uh, we're interested in local ear restoration, restoring fish ponds, uh, a fish pond down in Poipu, uh, uh, all the way to the Wahiava fish pond, uh, where they took all the water out of the whole Ahupua. Uh, Koloa runs from the Wahiava ditch, including Makawele Camp, where I spent the first two months of my life, uh, uh, to Kalaheo, and all the way to Makawele Pool, and includes uh, Hidden Valley, our, our Aveo Vale Nui. Uh, so the fish ponds, uh, we meet seasonally more than when necessary. Our next meeting is the 24th of November at Koloa Neighborhood Center at 7 p.m. At that meeting, our AMAC or Ahamoku Advisory Council liaison to the DLNR director, uh, staff, and preparer of a legislative report on the Ahamoku uh, will share details on the new rules adopted by AMAC. So that's coming up November 24th. There'll also be a meeting in different moku, uh, one in Waimea, uh, one somewhere in uh, the Pune district. I don't know the dates of those, but they will be posted on the DONR website as will our meeting. Um, we are stewards. Uh, we are practitioners of Aboriginal traditions of Koloamoku. Uh, any issue affecting the ecology and the environment within the South Shore and within our moku. Uh, we are the lens that should be approached as stewards of the land. And then if we can join with you, uh, you can enlist you know, us and our voice and uh, a channel to the DONR uh, if it concerns the environment, the ecology, uh, our resources and our traditions and practices, you know, uh, we welcome everyone's participation and any cause that is valid in that in protecting the environment. Uh, you know, we will do what we can to support. Uh, I also represent a private uh, mission that I've had for a number of years, Hui Hanai Ikaho Nuala'a, which means nurturers of sacred space. Uh, and it's a dance that I try to practice, uh, cultivating serenity in discord. Thank you very much, and aloha. Thank you. Um, the, our next, thanks, Branch, that was good. Um, uh, I know a lot of, I've just been learning about the Ahomoku system here. Our next group is Kohola Leo, Whale Voice, and our representative is Chair Kalsara Satesha. Hi, good evening. We are a nonprofit uh, whale conservation organization working for better understanding and protection for the whales and their ocean home. We have public meetings every first and fourth Fridays alternating between Kapa'a and Poipu. 
if you join our mailing list, we send out notices as to when, when and where our meetings are. Our main goal right now is to create a community-based stewardship coalition, starting with the Mahalapu area, marine environment, by working together to renew its health and generate a thriving ecosystem for all users. If you're interested in joining us, please contact me. We also show free movies on the fourth Friday of every month in the Kapa'a Library. They're always ocean-based at 7 p.m. And in January, we have a Welcome the Whale ceremony down in Kapa'a off Kealia Point. And it's kind of a free flow. Everyone participates who wants to, to come and welcome the whales back to Hawaii. On Friday, November 6th, Sunday, November 8th, and Monday, November 16th, I will be giving talks about who whales are, um, their behaviors, who they are socially, uh, the rituals they have, uh, their intelligence, things like that. Um, the November 6th and Monday, November uh, 16th is at the Hana Pepe Library, and Sunday, November 8th is at the Princeville Library. Thank you. Oh, and our website is whalevoice.org. Thanks, Galsara. Um, okay, Patricia Wistinghouse. Oh, Hapa. Come, come. Hawaii, Hawaii Alliance for Progressive, progressive Action. Action. So, Hapa. Aloha, everybody. Aloha. Right. Aloha. So, my name is Patricia Wistinghausen. I am with um, HAPA, so Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action. Um, our mission is to catalyze community empowerment and systemic change towards valuing aina, environment, and people ahead of corporate profit. So the whole idea, of course, is to get um, the community involved, empowered, um, participate in your government, whether it's by voting, encouraging others to vote, um, writing to your legislature, um, submitting testimony and so on. And then also um, a real big focus on environmental advocacy, which is why we were invited to be here today at the Eco Roundtable. Um, so a couple of things that I'm gonna talk about um, briefly is the Kuleana Academy. This is one of our new programs or initiatives that's pretty exciting. It basically um, says, you know, if you're a leader in your community, you'd like to run for public office, um, typically we're not trained on how to do that, on how to fundraise, how to talk to the media, how to um, work on, say, a community-based project um, and that mentorship aspect. So this program has all of those elements within it. Um, the deadline for this, though, is this Friday, um, so October 31st. Um, we've been taking applications. Um, it's anybody, I mean, of course, within the state of Hawaii, there's a number of different questions and things to answer that are on the website. If you go to um, hapahai.org, so H-A-P-A-H-I.org, I do have these materials, of course, and definitely ask um, questions if you have them. And so Kuleana Academy is something, if you can think of somebody, if it's not yourself, but you think of somebody that may um, want to apply or you think you want to urge them to apply, please take one of these or come and talk with me today or um, after this. And then finally, the other project I wanted to talk briefly about, we're still working out all the details, but this is in the spring, so in January. Um, it's going to be a Hawaii statewide speaking tour. We're bringing down speakers um, on environmental, I guess, topics, food security, um, a number of different issues basically on, that affect society um, and our food supply. So they're gonna come from different continents around the world. We're gonna be going island to island and then um, also just organizing um, a rally or workshops um, surrounding the opening of the legislature for the spring. And it's just something we wanted to kind of put out there. So we'll get more details soon, but thank you so much for having me. Aloha. Thanks, Patricia. Um, Rachel Smith from the Kauai Invasive Species Committee. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Hello, my name is Rachel Smith. I work for Kauai Invasive Species Committee. We are a nonprofit group under the University of Hawaii. We're funded privately as well as by county, state, and federal governments. And we take private donations 
anything we can get, really. We are the Kauai Invasive Species Committee. However, there is an ISC on every island. So there's a Maui Invasive Species Committee, a Molokai Invasive Species Committee, so on and so forth. Uh, we primarily target incipient invasive species, meaning anything that's new to the island. So we'd be the primary responders to the koki frog whenever it comes over, or mongoose if we get a new invasion of mongoose, or snakes. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have heard of myconia. It's a really bad invader. Uh, and Kauai, we have it on incipient levels and think we can eradicate it. So we only go after invasive species that can be eradicated. We're only funded to go after those. But we really look to the community and the public to help us kind of be our eyes and ears and uh, look out for what's going on in the wild. You know, we all have a pretty active outdoor lifestyle living in Kauai. So um, we have all of our species, target species listed on our website. It's kauaiisk.org. And I have magnets with our contact info and our website on the table back there by zero waste. Uh, so if you're out hiking or um, hunting or kayaking or camping, anything in the wild, we really look to the public to help us see what's going on out there. And if you see anything new or unusual, we would love for you to report it. So for example, the little fire ant, I'm sure you guys have heard about it. It's kind of becoming a big deal on some of the other islands outside of Big Island now. O Oahu and Maui are Unfortunately, they're finding quite a few infestations. And here, we have it down to undetectable levels. And so we think we're going to officially eradicate it. It's only on one remote location on the North Shore and a private residence. However, there is widespread tropical fire ant and other fire ants here on the island. Um, so we, we wouldn't target those. But if you were to ever find the little fire ant anywhere else on the island, we would want to know about it. If you hear a koki frog, we definitely want to know about it. And we work a lot with HDOA. We're kind of a, an organization that bridges the gaps between other organizations. We like to partner with whoever we can. So um, even though there are regulatory systems in place and, and, and laws as far as state noxious weeds. We want people to know that there's no conservation jail and no one is going to get in trouble if they have a false kava in their backyard or they have a koki frog in their backyard or one was accidentally introduced to their yard because they bought a plant from a nursery that had it in there. So um, we're really open to the public. I'm the outreach specialist. You can if you have any concerns or questions, you can shoot me an email with a picture of something you're worried about, and we'll come out and check it out. We remove any of our target species for free. So that's less yard work for you. So um, I have some other brochures and pens, and our email list is back there if you're interested. Thanks, Rachel. So we won't plant myconia in our backyard. Sorry. Okay, there are next. Ah, Jean Souza from the Hawaiian Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. Thank you. Good evening. Nice to see all of you. I'm with the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. My name is Jean Souza. I'm the Kauai Programs Coordinator. And this is Ann Walton, our uh, Planning and Policy um, Advisor. We both live here on Kauai. Um, we have a number of different programs focused on education, outreach, research, um, whale protection, and community engagement. Our primary uh, volunteer program starts recruitment in December with the Sanctuary Ocean Count, which is a shore-based count and monitoring of humpback whales. Um, around Kauai and on other islands. And we go through, um, we offer a training uh, program uh, with that and encourage those of you that are interested in humpback whales and uh, want to understand them more to sign up uh, with me and I can send you an email when um, the recruitment is open to the public in December. Um, <clears throat> we have a Sanctuary Advisory Council 
uh, statewide consisting of 50 plus members and actually we have um, a Sanctuary Advisory Council member here in the audience. Uh, it just so happens that on Kauai we have a total of five members uh, currently and we're going to be going through um, a major recruitment for um, vacancies in November. And the Sanctuary Advisory Council um, is um, made up of agency representatives. Uh, we have geographic representation, so we have representatives from Kauai. And we have subject matter experts and um, citizens. So uh, if you're interested in that, let me know. We will be starting um, a new um, program in January with uh, three other partners. And this program is an education program focused on uh, the Ahupua'a of, um, on the North Shore. And we will be um, offering for free to middle school students um, a field-based experience for about nine months starting in January. So um, it's going to be a whole lot of things such as wine culture, um, weather, uh, geology, ahupua'a, watersheds, streams, ocean, rivers, all of that kind of stuff we're going to cover that. So that's a, an exciting new project that we are partners uh, with um, three others to provide the with the, to the community. And uh, I'd like to mention that this Thursday at Lihue Library, our researcher, Ed Lyman, who also is the coordinator for the humpback whale or large whale entanglement response program, will be giving a free public lecture at Lihue Library at 10 a.m. So please uh, join us. Our website is hawaiihumpbackwhale.noaa.gov. We're a federal program with a state uh, co-management uh, relationship. So your federal tax dollars pay for the program. And we have a bunch of volunteers. So hope you can be involved. Thank you. Thanks, Jean. And our next group is GMO Free Kauai, Jerry DiPetro, and Hawaii Seed, which is the umbrella group, right, of GMO Free. Yeah, come on, Jerry. Aloha, family and friends. I'm Jerry DiPietro. I'm a volunteer with GMO Free Kauai and the president of Hawaii Seed. Hawaii Seed is our statewide nonprofit that helps to uh, umbrella the GMO free groups on each island. Um, our mission is mostly to educate ourselves and others about the concerns and environmental degradation of GMO um, test fields and um, pesticide use uh, at this high-end experimental level that we have on our islands and pretty much across the state. Um, we've had a really great year as far as um, a lot of outreach at the county fair, um, outreach on KKCR, and bringing speakers to the island. We just wrapped up um, a statewide tour with Judy Carmen from Australia and Stephanie Seneff, talking a lot about glyphosate. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard the recent news articles about glyphosate roundup being um, categorized now as a probable carcinogenic. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of Kauai. Um, everyone here in the room and beyond, we have so many volunteers on this island. You guys um, wake up passionate and um, work long, hard days consistently um, for a multiple, multitude of causes. and. Um, one of the exciting things I think I've seen in this year, all of us probably have, is the, the joining, the hooey of hooeys. Um, last year at the opening of the ledge, even the media reported about um, seeing the GMO free groups and the um, Aole TMT, uh, people standing up for um, good use of the farmlands, all joining together. And we have created a very powerful voting block 
all of us um, know each other, we're family, you know, it's a small community anyway, but it's really, really exciting. And this year, um, Hawaii Seed, um, we have especially have seen a huge growth on Oahu. You know, they've the largest population, they've been the hardest to organize, you know, over this last decade. Um, but we now have a great parents group forming around on the North Shore um, because their elementary school, much like our Waimea Canyon Middle School, is adjacent to um, experimental field crops. So the um, North Shore Ohana has now become very vocal. Um, we've had the Aloha Aina Unity Project putting on these um, large marches. We've done down through Waikiki, about 10,000 people, just did Maui through Lahaina um, with a few thousand people for sure, and we'll be uh, looking forward to a march on Kauai as well in the coming months. So um, I almost feel like there's, there's so many little projects going on in GMO-free land um, that we could almost have our own eco roundtable of all the little groups of you guys, you know, people looking at honey, at bees, at water diversion, at pesticide disclosure and reporting. Um, it's really exciting at, at how much the volume of, of data that um, we're starting to get a handle on, um, you know, much to the chagrin of the industry that really does not want to tell us anything or have any oversight. Um, one of the, the things I look forward to in this year coming up is uh, more study on the neonicotinoids. Um, nationally, globally, people are looking at decline in, the, in our pollinator pollin um, population. And I'm starting to realize that here on the island with the production of the seeds and the seeds staying to be replanted you know, for about 10 cycles, the most likely these seeds get laid out on a table or in some type of a, a facility and are coated with the neonicotinoids right here on island. And we know very little about that. So um, that's something that I think we really have to be more concerned about. Hawaii Seed um, recently, a few months ago, um, got funding to work on the, a banana project. To, we've identified 15 native banana um, species and we're working to propagate and have um, good banks of healthy plants um, as they are trying to release the GMO banana. So um, we're trying to always stay one step ahead. And, um, you know, I think in closing, one of the biggest things we can all do is to help to grow our own food. Every time I see a, a garden started, it's like we're winning in that direction. Um, planting and growing and sharing our own food is one of the um, biggest things that we can do to help um, avoid climate change. And as Billie Holiday sung, God bless the child who has his own. So um, thank you all for being interested in growing our own food and making a big major shift on Kauai. And thank you for all your work. Aloha. Thanks, Yuri. Um, um, but the next group is friends of Maha Ulipu, uh, Bridget Hammerquist. Bridget? Hi, good evening. As Gordon said, my name is Bridget Hammerquist, and I'm here with several other members of Friends of Mahalapu. The Moku for the whole Kona district, Billy Kahulalei, is here. Ranch Harmony, our um, Ahamoku representative for uh, Mahalaipu is here. And um, we formed, actually, shortly after a 2,000 cow dairy was proposed for Mahalapu. We started to study uh, what, if anything, that would do to the environment. And as we read and learned more about many states right now in our own country, as well as New Zealand and Australia that are suffering from the terrible uh, degradation of the environment and the introduction of hazardous waste, really, um, because of the volume, the bacteria counts, and the nitrate levels, we felt we should form a community-based organization to study it and then to decide whether to um, speak out, and, and we did all of that. 
And so you as the public members have heard and we've had a lot of help, as Jerry said, from other organizations, from other HUIs. Um, Surfrider um, shared with us their Blue Water Task Force testing that they'd been doing and expanded their testing to include the Waiopili stream because up until that time, um, the winter of, of 2014, actually January, February, nothing had really been happening in Mahalapu and all of a sudden there was um, massive use of Roundup to kill the guinea grass that was on hundreds and hundreds of acres because they wanted to plant kukui grass. And then there was plowing of fields and moving of dirt, all without a NPDES permit, despite the um, state's actual recommendation that they get one. And then finally the state came out January 16th of 2015 and told them to get one. They still don't have one. And they've been, in their uh, statements in the public, they've been digging test wells, um, preparing pastures, planting grasses, moving to earth, putting up fencing, and they don't think that counts. And we know we've talked with contractors here on island who say they aren't able to drill any wells without an NPDES permit. So um, the group doing it is Hawaii Dairy Farms. They're funded and supported by Ulupono Initiative. The Ulupono Initiative has a philanthropic side and it has a commercial uh, investment side, capital investment side. And it's the capital investment side that's funded by Pierre Midiar that's proposing to put in this dairy at Moholepu. We have a table over there. We brought a fact sheet. Um, we also brought with us a binder of materials that was recently presented to Governor Ige as we sent out the dairies planned to experts on the mainland. And they were dairy scientists and people that have spent all their careers in dairy work. Um, we gained a lot of information about nitrate <laughs> contamination of the water and large cities and small cities throughout the United States that have lost their drinking water because of nitrate infiltration from animal waste. And to get a handle on it, um, I came across an EPA study that's about 327 pages long and it took two years to do it was released the end of 2012, and they did some very scientific prolonged work to try to get a handle on how does cow waste compare to human waste. And what they said was that 2,000 dairy cows produce daily waste that's the equivalent to a city of 328,000 people. So you have to picture 328,000 people leaving untreated waste in Mahalapu Valley and you'll have an idea of what 2,000 dairy cows are gonna do. But 2,000 dairy cows will produce 300,000 pounds of fresh manure daily, and they'll produce 20,000 gallons of urine daily. Each cow will consume 50, excuse me, 50 gallons of water daily. Um, these statistics are not um, in contention. They're facts, they're produced all over the United States. Our fact sheet has been on our website, and if anyone would like to visit it, it's pretty easy. It's friendsofmahalepu.org, um, and we have a lot of information on that. Malama Mahalapu, an older organization, um, had differences of opinion in their board members, and they couldn't um, quite see their way to coming out one way or the other initially, and so actually some of their members encouraged us to form another based group um, that was keen on saving the valley from the proposed dairy, and that's what we're all about. We also have some materials that were prepared um, actually by the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is an arm of the United States Department of Agriculture, and the USDA, um, NRCS office on Oahu, um, did a custom soil resource report at the request of the people that were wanting a dairy in Mahalapu. Um, and they actually came out June 5th of this past year, and they reported that animal waste, a land-based application of animal waste, um, that that location is not well suited for it. And they described the soil type, they described the ditches, the irrigation ditches, and the streams that run through the property that go directly to the ocean, which as of July of this past year, um, Congress and the EPA now recognize 
as falling under the Clean Water Act. Um, we've had the Surfrider test results now for over 15 months um, that happen to coincide with the dairy's work in the valley showing massive amounts of pollution. It's the most polluted stream on island consistently 100% of the time for the last 15 months. And it's polluted with a, a lot of dangerous bacteria, extra turbidity because of the grubbing and grating, I'm sure. But it is um, really a potential disaster that it'll affect not only Mahalapu, Mahalapu Beach, the entire South Shore where the currents carry the waste, but it will ultimately impact the island. We have a, a, a great, um, he was an industrial entomologist. I didn't know there were such things, but he's basically an expert who worked in dairy in the mainland, and he actually did his master's thesis on the fly. And the biting flies that are already in the state of Hawaii um, will be one of the biggest problems for the public. Uh, they have a four mile easy flight plan that they take and they breed in the millions in cow waste. They love manure, they love cow patties to breed in. So uh, these biting flies will be a real plague for the island and for our visitors. Um, and so Carlos White actually got involved and encouraged me to do more. There are two or three men in the community that kept calling and saying, you need to get this, you need to get that. So we've had a lot of great help. And he wrote a letter directly to Mayor Carvalho asking um, that he seriously consider relocating it. It's not a great location. Recently, you've probably seen some letters to the editor from people that have long been established on the island. So I thank you for your interest and welcome you to the table and come up to any of us if you have any questions afterward. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Oh, well, why don't you do that now? That's, we're, we're on Maha Ulepu, might as well go for it. Um. Uh, I just want to take a moment to speak on behalf of Ma Lama Maha Ulipu and some of uh, the differences. Uh, Malama Maha Ulipu was uh, initially formed by some cousins of mine uh, in Koloa, uh, along with David Chang and the Wong sisters, who were classmates of mine as well. Uh, back in 75, 76, and they successfully kept a major development from happening at Maha Ulipu. These were KCC students, young students banded together, and they proved that it could be done. Uh, it was followed by uh, native rights groups dealing with the quarry, dealing with access to the quarry, dealing with the uh, land award plots and the Kulianas. In 1986, David Chang, uh, dear departed friend, and Linda O'Shiro formed uh, a Ohana Maha Ulipu group uh, to keep it going, anticipating, uh, in a proactive way, anticipating threats and dangers to the area which they knew. Now here's the, here's Part of the thing is, they didn't just get this idea on their own in 76. They listened to Larry Wong. They listened to uh, their mom, uh, who was Kapuni Ai, a relative of mine. Uh, they listened to the elders gripe and say quiet things in the community about that isn't right to do something there. Because the lore and the knowledge and the traditions for generations have been that it's a mausoleum of cultural ancestral bones. Uh, people didn't go there without a purpose. Uh, it also uh, is a repository of cultural resources. Uh, our ancestors knew that anything that happened water-wise, Mahawilipu, um, Kipukai, it comes right around down to Poipu and to Kukuyula. So the health of Mahawilipu is integral to the health 
of the South Shore community. Uh, David and folks knew this in a, you know, uh, in a Western way. They learned this as students, uh, and they fought to preserve it as open space and as a repository uh, of cultural resources and an open recreational area for folks. Uh, uh, in 2000, um, the Sierra Club gave a grant. We were able to hire Beryl Blake, and she has served uh, she's now a board member. She has served at Malama Mahawiripu um, vigorously for 15 years. I'm the uh, longest serving board member and continuing board member of the group, although I am sometimes in contentious um, uh, disagreement with some of them. Uh, uh, I am personally committed to Mahawiripu because it is my heritage. Um, but the group Malama Mahawiripu their focus is on the whole uh, area, uh, the, all the threats and involvements. They've been working, trying to get um, some accord with the landowners, some agreements with the county to educate people, to assess and to uh, get national parks, get uh, Senator Inouye and other folks involved. They recognized that the dairy project is a single major threat to the whole area and they encourage friends of Mahawilipu to develop their resources towards a single pointed uh, resistance to that project. Uh, and uh, I'm working with friends of Mahawilipu, uh, I'm working with Malama Mahawilipu, I'm working with Surf Rider, I'm working with any group uh, who is willing to engage to help to protect this fragile environment and to nurture our resources. Aloha mahalo. Thanks, Branch. And, um, okay, Wilkie and Patrick uh, have a project they want to introduce. Had Wilkie McLaren and Patrick Combe. Hi. <laughs> Hello, guys. Thanks for uh, hearing us out for a few minutes. We're with uh, Ban Aerosol Sunscreens Kauai. It's a new start thing that I think probably most people in here um, kind of understand how dangerous aerosol sunscreens are and basically how stupid they are. Um, so I'm going to let you talk about some key points. Um, so we're just getting started, but it's been years that this has been bothering me, probably a lot of you too, who don't love the summer anymore where you used to be able to go to the beach and not have to inhale toxic atomized chemicals into your lungs and swim in them. <laughs> the turtles probably don't like it much either. Um, but the, what we're hoping to do is just kind of like raise awareness about this and use the aerosols as a starting point and do that on Kauai because Kauai people are rad <laughs> at getting things done. Um, so you might have seen that article recently, the last five days that started making its way around. Has anyone not read it about oxybenzone? I, I'm going to just read a little bit about it. Um, so for years, scientists have warned that sunscreen is killing the world's coral reefs. Now a new study confirms those concerns, revealing that the chemical oxybenzone found in more than 30, 35 Hundred sunscreen products worldwide can be harmful in concentrations as small as 62 parts per trillion, the equivalent of a single drop of water in a six and a half Olympic sized swimming pool. Um, the use of oxybenzone containing products needs to be seriously deliberated in islands and areas where coral reef conservation is a critical issue. This is by the lead author, Dr. Craig Downs, and I can't even pronounce the name Hereticus Environmental Laboratory. I guess I pronounced it fine. Clifford, Virginia. Um, but he actually graduated at uh, University of Hawaii, Manoa. Um, any effort to reduce oxybenzone pollution could mean a local coral reef survives, survives a long hot summer or recovery for a degraded reef. Everyone wants to build coral nurseries for reef restoration, but this is an inconsequential effort if the factors that originally killed off the reef remain or intensify in the environment. Um, what was kind of scary is that we saw these toxic uh, toxicolo 
logical effects within two hours of being exposed. Um, oh, and in Hawaii in 2011, and he said it's increased. They did this, the testing on Oahu and Maui. Um, it's 700 parts per trillion. So, you know, what did he say? 62 is bad. <laughs> um, so go Waikiki and you're going to, you know, then, yeah. <laughs> The chemical damages the DNA of corals can prevent them from reproducing, acts as an endocrine disruptor. This all happens to people too, but that's not what this study is about. Causing juvenile coral to encase themselves within their own skeleton, ultimately leading to their death and preventing future generations of coral from repopulating the skeleton. Spray on sunscreens appear to be especially damaging. We found that oxybenzone is at its highest concentration at high tide. Um, and then the, uh, the, uh, Marine, uh, University of Hawaii at uh, Hilo Department of Marine Science Associate Professor Misaki Takabayashi said that the results are sobering, but steps can be taken to prevent further damage to Hawaii's coral reefs. So um, basically, you know, all of our shops here, you know, the local shops, <laughs> You know, whether you're going to Costco, yeah, um, but, you know, Foodlands, ABC stores, the little shops, two surf shops, all the surf sunscreens, um, it, it, they all have these ingredients in them. And this is just one ingredient when, you know, in the mix is actually so many other horrifying ingredients, too. Um, so, like we said, we kind of want to... We want to give alternatives to the shops, so educating people, educating stores, giving alternatives. There's so many alternative sunscreen brands now that work, whether you're a surfer, a mom, both. <laughs> um, so there's places that already ban uh, sunscreens. They'll confiscate them at the airports. It's not some crazy wild idea. Um, it can be done, and actually some countries are, are wanting to ban anything with oxybenzone already. So we just want to get people that are interested in helping us with this to uh, sign our little teeny paper over there. That <laughs> has to start somewhere. And, um, and then I just put up a little Facebook page that's uh, ban. Um, what Aerosol is, sunscreens quiet. There you go. It says it all. <laughs> yeah. we, think, we think the timing is right now because of the coral bleaching crisis, right? I'm, that's pretty much worldwide news that gets into every social media site and TV and paper. It's uh, very prevalent in the news and people are starting to understand, you know, temperature and, and how fragile these systems are. And now with this latest research that's come out and you just see it spread like wildfire with social media about how oxybenzone, this one chemical that's like one of the most prevalent chemicals, endocrine disrupting toxic waste that it does and I think you can all imagine going to the beach and you're 50 to 100 yards downwind to someone who's just spraying it into the air where just a little bit gets on them. I mean the other day I was surfing about 300 yards offshore in Eni and it was a no wind day and I could smell it and I'm pretty good with distance you know and that's he does every, everything by football every, field every day you yards. know and that's where I go surf way far away so I can stay away from that kind of garbage Consumer Sorry. Reports last year said, never, ever, ever spray an aerosol sunscreen on a child. Yeah. And they, say, they recommend that you actually take the aerosol and spray it in your hand, because that makes a lot of sense, and then rub it on. Yeah. So we think <laughs> so. The, ti the timing is right. And basically why we're here is just to kind of get it out there, and because this is a meeting of minds where people have a lot of uh, you know, experience with the local legislature. And I've tried yeah. to contact two different council members in the last couple months who kind of blew me off about, you know, maybe they're not allowed to give advice to someone like me about how to get a bill passed. So starting a petition, uh, what we do in our day jobs, we are in the, in the community every day. And like my, myself personally, I, I speak in all honesty when I go to work to about five to 600 people per day in a marine related environment. I manage a, a surf shop. Um, I won't leave that out of here, but, but I talk to people, rent snorkel gear, surf, surf lessons. We talk about it every day. There's a constant influx in tourism. I don't know the numbers of people, how many people come to Kauai, but number one reason why they come here has got to be the ocean. And people come here and they go to Foodland and you see a whole wall of copper tone and banana boat. You go to Costco and you can get a vat of uh, stuff. And there are a lot of great products that can be offered, education. And you can get on your soapbox in your job or come to a place like this and, and talk all you want. But we think that the best thing to do now is actually make it 
uh, hopefully a county ordinance where you cannot use aerosol sunscreens to start with. So who, if anyone I don't need knows to breathe it. how to do that, and yeah, also <laughs> how, how did they ban smoking, you know, uh, on yeah. all the beaches? <laughs> um, you know. No, well, the questions will be afterwards. Oh, later. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we're not going to have group op questions. You talk to them individually. Although this sounds like it, you should speak to Carl Berg and make this a project in the Surfrider Foundation. Carl uh, Berg is the chair of the Kauai chapter of the Surfrider Foundation. Carl? I thought it was last on the list. Okay. <laughs> Aloha. Um, I'm re tonight I'm representing the Kauai chapter of the Surfrider Foundation, which is a big international organization. The uh, mission of that group is a dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's ocean, waves, and beaches through a powerful activist network focusing on conservation, activism, research and education. So you might note that there's nothing about surfing in there. We're a hardcore environmental organization out there to protect the oceans, the waves, and the beaches. And we have a number of programs that we on this island focus on, although we are strongly a part of the national organization, Surfrider, uh, who keep us in line, or try to. One of the first things that we deal with is beach access, and we don't have too many problems with that at the moment, but as we're continually having new uh, resorts developed, and we want to make sure that there's adequate parking so people can go to their surf sites, for example. Um, one case is the uh, principal hotel. They only have five little surf parking spots, and it, that's not good. Second, and a tie-in to what we just heard, is we have the Blue Water Task Force where we're looking at water quality in the oceans, estuaries, and streams. Uh, and we do our water testing mainly for fecal indicating bacteria, which is something that the Department of Health does, but they only test on the beaches. And we test out at the surf sites, and we test in the sources of pollution, the, the streams coming down. And we have a number of streams that are highly polluted, but our testing has shown that Waipili at Mahalulapu is 10 times worse than the worst stream, which is 100 times worse than they're supposed to be. We do a lot of beach cleanups and net patrols. We have monthly beach cleanups, which is the third Saturday of the month. We can go to our website, kawaii.surfrider.org, and find out where it is that we meet, 9 o'clock on the third Saturday. Come help us get all the rubbish off the, the beach. We're really concerned about our, our friends, the whales, the turtles, the seals, the birds, the, the coral. And so we also target uh, those areas that have big nets, heavy nets, and recently the debris coming in from Japan tsunami. Uh, we've been cleaning that up for over two years now, and we're still finding stuff that we can identify as uh, tsunami debris. We, as an aside, in a sense, we also check it for radiation. We have a Geiger counter, and there's never been any indication that anything was, was hot. Uh, our bigger project um, is rising above plastics, and under that, we were very strong advocates of banning the plastic bags. We're now also joining in with Zero Waste on uh, banning styrofoam, and we have bumper stickers over there, styrofoam free Kauai. We're hoping to work with um, the county council members not only on this island, but we're coordinating with the Hawaii and Maui council members to come up with a, uh, a bill to ban styrofoam food containers mainly uh, on all of the islands. We, we don't think there's any hope for the island of Oahu, but they can follow us like they did with the plastic bag ban. So those are our main uh, efforts. We're trying to keep the water clean. We're trying to keep the beaches clean of all the debris. We're trying to be proactive and go, as Pat saying, get at the debris before it gets into the ocean. We try to stop pollution before it happens. It's a losing game if you're just continually picking up somebody else's uh, trash. The plastic bag bill is a prime example, and banned styrofoam is another one. 
Um, as part of water pollution, um, we are looking at pesticides when, when we're working with Jerry, um, looking for pesticides, atrazine, metallic chlor, glyphosate in the streams and ditches on this island. Um, we're finishing up that study now, and we found uh, glyphosate in about 60% of our samples. It's, it's everywhere. Um, we're also working with a student, look for um, glyphosate in honey, and we found that in, uh, see, I think it was 20% of our samples. So this, this glyphosate is ubiquitous. It's used both by large-scale agriculture and the little homeowners and the county and the state highways, and so we feel that this is detrimental to the marine life as it all washes down, and so we're looking into that and trying to, going to be providing that information to the county's Jack, uh, joint fact-finding uh, group because when that was set up, we really didn't have any idea of what, um, what was out there. We needed somebody to actually go test it. Um, I think those are our main programs, and we're, we have a seven-member executive board, uh, Gordon, myself, Rob, and Robert back there are all here tonight. Uh, and so if you have any questions, grab hold of us. Uh, I'm personally going to have to run because I, I want to hit a meeting going on about bees uh, that the county is funding about pesticides in bees and in the pollen. And they're doing a, another study. And that was started at 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock. So I'm hoping to talk to that lady on that. Okay, thank you very much. One of the things that uh, was uh, kind of the buzz of the island is people kept uh, asking each other, why don't we grow hemp on Kauai? And it's a good question. So what I decided to do was put together a radio show. So I have a radio show, it's called the Kauai Island Hemp Show. And I'm opening up the subject. I've had two shows already. Uh, the first one was sort of a, hi, this is what I'm doing, what do you think? The second one was, a uh, gentleman, his name was Joe, and he was a speaker, and he was talking about, I can't, Kanaf, yeah. thank you. Um, Kanaf, <coughs> my brain cells are turning brown. Um, and it looks like Kanaf is a good, a very good crop, and it, could, it does mostly everything that um, hemp does, and it's, and it's legal. Um, so one of the things that came to me was that we have some things growing on the island that are not very healthy for the land, the water, the people, et cetera, et cetera the bees, uh, et cetera. And it would be nice if we could grow another crop. And it would be nice if we had that crop that could provide cottage industries for the people who actually live here. So I'd like to sort of open that up as some thoughts. Um, as I understand it, uh, here we are. And we keep doing, as a, as a culture, as a society, we keep doing the same things over and over and over that are harmful to ourselves and the future generations. And it's time we stop. And I think this is a good place to take a look at it and maybe make some changes. If we don't change and we keep going down the same road, as my friend Don May used to say, if we keep going down that road, we're going to get there. And there is not pleasant, uh, especially for future generations. So um, the show, the next show, um, hopefully if it works out well, the gentleman I'm going to be interviewing is in Ireland. And he wrote a really interesting, beautifully done book on how to use hemp at, for building materials. And uh, building materials are boards, uh, hempcrete. And uh, I don't know if you know anything about hemp. It has no THC, so you can't get high from it. Um, and it's used for many, many, many products. Uh, fuel, food, building materials, um, fabric. It's just a superior product. And one of the things that's really nice I just learned is that it's used for jewelry. The resin makes gorgeous jewelry. So uh, people that are interested in, uh, in arts and crafts, uh, it makes paint, it makes paper, it does all kinds of wonderful things. So my show is on the first, I mean, excuse me, the third Monday of the month, and it's between five and six. It's on KKCR. So I'd like to uh, have you dial in, listen. Uh, I'd love to get your feedback. Um, I think it's an important subject uh, for everyone living here, especially the farmers. And um, I think that one of my goals is to form a organization. And so if hemp does become legal, 
that we make sure that it benefits everyone, especially the people who live on this island. I would hate to see another one of those crops that uh, very few people make all the money and it gets sent and the product gets exported. So we have an opportunity here to make some changes and I'd like to explore that. Um, I went to the Kentucky Hemp Conference and I learned a lot. And one of the things that I learned was hemp does not like clay soil and hemp does not like to get its feet wet. So we have some, if we decide to do the, to grow hemp here, we have some challenges. And it looks like those challenges can be overcome by different strains and so forth. But we have a lot of homework to do. We have a lot of talking to do. We have a lot of meetings that need to happen. And the communities need to come together and come up with some solutions to our future. So my motto is, let's have a better future. Let's grow one. So anyway, thank you very much. Okay, we're we're on our last our last group, and so our last talk is uh, Laurel Breyer from Apollo, Hawaii. Um, we started 11 years ago. We're an advocacy and education group for alternative energies um, on Kauai, looking at socially responsible, environmentally responsible alternatives to fossil fuel, efficiency, conservation because we're concerned about greenhouse gases and climate change, the greatest crises that humankind will ever face. Um, from 11 years ago, there are actually more deniers now than there were 11 years ago because it's well-funded. And it's well-funded by the fossil fuel industry and other invested interests. But there's also now this moral crusade with the churches and such um, raising consciousness about what else caught the, the great inequities that climate change is causing to the poorest of the poor, the people who have the least to do with causing it. So um, what Apollo Kauai, we're, we actually have some very dynamic things coming up right now too, because although now, if we had really responded to it when we knew about it um, 30, 25 years ago, it would be a different game, but now there's very few, there's no really non-radical options left. But what that gives us is an opportunity to change it all up and to look at the bigger picture and to look at our unbridled consumerism, our addiction to fossil fuel, the things that the corporate greed, the deregulation of trade, the things that have really um, put this in fast speed, push this so much, it's, it's happening so rapidly and it's self-reinforcing. Um, so uh, actually we're, I think people know the, uh, the Paris climate talks are coming up. We don't have a lot of hope for what's gonna come out of that for our government just because it's gonna have to be ratified and it's become such a partisan issue. But that's why the people, it's an opportunity for people to really um, take it back. And uh, there's going to be a huge Global Day of Action. Write this on your calendar on the 29th of November. And we're planning, um, we haven't worked out our details yet, but we're, there's gonna be a big concert that day, the medicine for the people and NACO and other groups up at Church of the Pacific. And at four o'clock, they're giving us the stage and we're gonna have a big um, photo shoot. So that's Sunday the 29th at four o'clock at Church of the Pacific. But in the meantime, there's a great opportunity. We're um, partnering with Kauai Community College and we're going to be showing the movie, This Changes Everything, Naomi Klein's uh, book that actually gives the hope of how we can rethink how we live and do things differently to really deal with climate change. So we're gonna have two showings. The first showing is gonna be on Saturday, November 14th. The second showing, this is at KCC Cafeteria, will be on November, Sunday, November 20th. So those are big things that are happening. Uh, our, uh, our group is now, we have action groups. There's four action groups. Um, one is transportation, uh, the bus. Um, Councilman Yukimura is working with us on that, how we can make our, our bus more, uh, uh, more available to people and expand the services. We have our advocacy group, which is uh, working on the Global Awareness Day 
education group, which is working with KCC and showing the film, and we have regular speakers coming in. And then we have an emissions group that is looking at county, state standards, and individual action. So that's what Apollo is. Check out our website, and remember those dates. And we're all in this together. All right, so that's it for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And again, don't rush out the door. Talk to each other. That's the whole purpose of this meeting. And we'll try to do this at least twice a year. Thanks. <laughs>